Okay, chapter 38, the challenges of the post-war order. We're going to start out in this chapter talking about the 1970s, continuing on here with uh, 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 Nixon, who became president in 68 and then won in a landslide in 72. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, after his uh, swearing in, uh, Watergate happened. It came came to the public's eye during that time. It was June 17th, 1972, and five men working for uh, the, Re the Republican Committee to reelect the president, called CREEP, C-R-E-E-P, Committee to Reelect the President. Uh, they were caught breaking into the Watergate Hotel, which is located in Washington, D.C. They were placing bugs in the room um, so that they could hear what was going on with um, with with the Democrat Party and what they were going to say in a debate that that uh, Goldwater and Nixon were going to have. Um, that's the reason that they were going to do it to prepare for that debate. And it was highly illegal, obviously, breaking into someone's room, placing listening devices, bugs in the room, um, and then this provoked all kinds of issues. Um, did the president know about it? Um, and if he didn't know about it, he probably should have known about it. So it's, it's really not a, a defense to say you just didn't know about it unless you come out and, you know, just come out and, and publicly say, I, I didn't, I don't condone this. It shouldn't happen. The problem is Nixon did not do that. He tried everything he could to cover it up. And that's where he got in trouble. It provoked, uh, the exposure of the illegal use of the FBI and the CIA to go out and uh, you know spy on different groups and whatnot. There were hearings about what happened, and then of course the cover up. There's a Watergate Hotel right there. Um, it's it it was a uh, currently it's a, a part apartment complex, a high end apartment complex in Washington D.C., and that's the site of of where it happened. Now, the, the, the big thing was is that there were um, top secret sources that, that they, they were given uh, the Washington Post a lot of information about what was happening. There was someone on the inside who was, you know, who, someone that was on the inside with Nixon who was uh, telling, going and saying what what they were saying in meetings and going to the newspaper and the newspaper was finding out and they could never figure out who the uh, source was, the secret source. And Woodwards and Bernstein, who were the reporters for Washington Post, refused to give up their source. Uh, that person became known, <laughs> interestingly enough, as Deep Throat. And, and the reason that they called him Deep Throat was because they were meeting in a garage somewhere and he was giving them this top secret information. And anyways, Deep Throat was a porno during the day. So <laughs> this guy became known as Deep Throat. Uh, it says here, Deep Throat is a name that was given to a secret source who leaked information about the involvement of Richard Nixon's administration in the events that came to be known as the Watergate scandal. Deep Throat was an important source for Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, who together wrote a series of articles on the scandal that played a decisive role in exposing the misdeeds of the Nixon administration. The scandal would eventually lead to the resignation of President Nixon. In 2005, when former Deputy Director of the FBI, Mark Felt, admitted to Vanity Fair that he was Deep Throat, a source of the scandal, then that came speculation was finally put to rest. Here is Mark Felt. He basically on his deathbed um, admitted that he was deep throat. So we now know that it was the director of the FBI who was given that information. Well, it, how, how this whole thing came down and how the president got himself in trouble is yes, he did uh, try to cover everything up. And then, but, but the problem is uh, it, there were listening devices all throughout the White, White House that were recording everything that goes on. That was the idea of Nixon and he wanted to preserve his presidency and history and wanted everybody to know what went on in the White House, kind of like a modern day um, reality show type thing. He, he, everything was recorded constantly all day long, every meeting, every uh, interaction between people. 
Um, so, and the, the Supreme Court found out about this and they demanded tapes to, uh, you know, know what was going on and what, what Nixon was saying in these meetings and how much did he know, how much did he not know? Um, well, the president did come out with the tapes, but they were spliced and cut and, and you couldn't tell. And, and the, the reason that the president gave for why the, they cut so much out of the tapes was because he had a foul mouth and he didn't want them to hear him cussing all the time. In reality, there was some damning evidence that he knew exactly what was going on. Eventually, the Supreme Court demanded that they, that they uh, come forward with the original tapes, which they did. And then shortly thereafter, the president resigned before uh, impeachment. The, he, he, was, he would have been impeached uh, before they were going to vote on impeachment. He resigned. Previous to that, um, Spiro Agnew was forced to resign in 1973 due to uh, tax evasion in his home state of Maryland. So you had a unique situation in that Nixon chose his vice president after, after Spiro Agnew resigned, and it was Gerald Ford uh, from Michigan who who was who became his up who was appointed vice president after the uh, after the resignation of of Spiro Agnew so a unique situation in that after Nixon does resign you're going to have the only president in American his, history not to be elected into that position he was assigned vice president and then became president after the resignation of Nixon uh, known as the Saturday night massacre it was October of 1973 when Archibald Cox, who was a special prosecutor in the Watergate case, issued a subpoena for, the, for those tapes that I was talking about. He was fired by uh, Nixon, and, and a number of others were fired on that day. It became known as the Saturday Night Massacre, uh, very reminiscent of what uh, Trump was doing. There were times when he was firing people left and right, and they, people like Bob Woodward was coming out on CNN recently and saying that it was like Saturday Night Massacre when he was firing everybody. On November 17, 1973, Nixon gave a televised press conference urging Americans to put Watergate behind them, saying, in my years of public life, I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. So you see some funny memes and things about not being a crook, Richard Nixon. And then from that speech right there, uh, it, it was July of 74 when the Supreme Court ruled that Nixon had to give up those tapes. And then uh, the, the House approved the first articles of impeachment and they were going to, uh, you know, follow through. And that's when Nixon released the tapes and then resigned. It was August 8th, 1974. He became the first U.S. president and only U.S. president to resign. And then you have that unique situation I was talking about where Gerald Ford, who was appointed vice president, now became president of the United States. And it says here, the first unelected unelect president. He was the first unelected president ever since his name had been submitted by Nixon as VP candidate. In uh, July of 75, Ford, uh, one of his shining moments was the signing of what's called the Helsinki Accords, which recognized the Soviet's boundaries um, but not much else. Pretty insignificant time as president um, for, for uh, Ford. Uh, let's talk about the end of the economic boom. I had a slide up a couple chapters ago that said 1950 to 1970 was uh, unchecked economic growth in the United States like, like the U.S. had never seen ever and to this day. Uh, that long period of economic growth caused by weapons manufacturing, uh, computers, technology. Well, that's going to come to an end. And then 1970s, the uh, economy is going to be stagnated. It's, we're going to suffer huge amounts of inflation, going to be a huge problem. Inflation is going to be a gigantic problem. And the Federal Reserve is going to jack up the interest rate above 20%, which meant nobody was borrowing money to buy cars and houses and use their credit card. Everything slowed down in the 1970s. It says here, the entire decade of the 1970s did not witness a productivity advance equivalent to even one year's progress in the preceding two decades. How about that? Let me read that again. The entire decade, the entire nine, 10 years of the 70s didn't witness a productivity advance equivalent to even one year's progress in the preceding two decades or 20 years 
previous. It, at the new rate, it would take 500 more years to bring about another doubling of the average worker standard of, of living. So just to put things in perspective right there. Now, here's why. Here's some of the reasons why the 1970s was such a bad situation economically. The uh, increased presence of women and teenagers in the workforce. Um, and that it, it just, you know, it is what it is. It slowed things down. Declining investment in new machinery, the heavy cost of compliance with government imposed safety and health regulations. Uh, things like when Nixon uh, created OSHA, Occupational safe, Safety and Health for the work, work place. Um, work, they're always going to have to make sure that everything's safe, which is a good thing, but it also costs money. And, uh, you know, you had to be in compliance and, and that was going to hurt uh, the bottom line profits for some of these businesses. The shift of the American economy from manufacturing to services. And when a couple chapters goes, ago, we talked about the uh, white collar taking over for blue collar. Well, here you go. Um, that's, that's big. That's hard difficult to, to achieve that, the same kind of numbers as they did before. And then former president LBJ spending on the Vietnam War and his Great Society's program. Great Society, you know, was, was a money drain. Right? There was a ton of money going out to all different groups and the creation of, of the uh, two more cabinet departments, Housing and Urban Development and Department of Transportation. I mean, it was just draining the amount of money um, for the government. And then here's a big thing right here is that both military spending and welfare spending are inherently inflationary in the absence of offsetting tax collections. They put dollars in people's hands without adding to the supply of goods that those dollars can buy. So it, really important that you understand that military spending where you're paying soldiers to fight, you're paying people to work in factories to produce for the war, you, but you're not producing new cars that people could go buy at the store of, at the lot. You're not you're not uh, producing goods that people are going to want. So military spending and and welfare spending, where you're putting money in people's hands without increasing the number, the amount of goods out there that people could buy is is definitely inflationary. And that's one of the big, big problems in the 70s. Uh, and then, you know, there was that ceasefire in 1973. And then the disaster happened is the North Vietnamese came down and invaded the South and totally uh, took over the entire country. There is no more North Vietnam, and South Vietnam. It's all one country and it is communist and it's been communist ever since 1975. Uh, it was an embarrassment for the Ford administration, even though he had nothing to do with it, but that's kind of the way Americans handle things. Right? They blame the guy in charge. What could he have done? Does, do people really want it? Did they, they really want him to send troops over there again? A high land likely but they're looking for a scapegoat and Ford was that guy. Uh, you have the, this uh, well-known photo, the last Huey out of Saigon is the title of it. It's uh, the American embassy there as, as people were getting out of there as quickly as they can as the North Vietnamese invaded and took over successfully. In the 1976 election, again, Gerald Ford is, is really blamed for a lot of the stuff that went on and he goes against a guy that was a, a uh, big time dark horse in Jimmy Carter. Most people have never even heard of Jimmy Carter before he runs for president. He came out and said, I will never lie to you. And after what had gone on the previous years with Vietnam, with LBJ, the credibility gap, and then Watergate, it was the perfect line right there. I will never lie to you. So Jimmy Carter barely squeezed by Gerald Ford, 297 to 240, but he ends up winning. The interesting thing about Gerald Ford is he'd never been to Washington, D.C. He was a guy that had been the governor of Georgia, but, uh, you know, he was kind of an outsider. And that's what people were looking for at the time. At the end of the day, and he still is at this time, uh, Carter is a champion for human rights. And he's big into that, um, even, even currently, uh, when he's up for it, because he's pretty old. In Rhodesia and South Africa, he stood up for African-American black rights right? in those countries, um, apartheid and things like that. He was a champion for civil rights for people all over the world, not just the United States. The shining moment definitely for the Carter administration was uh, he brokered a, an agreement between Israel and Egypt, which had never been done before. It was huge. He brought the two sides to Camp David. Uh, the leader of Egypt was Anwar Sadat, the leader of Israel at the time was Menachem Begin. 
and he had them, I mean, he brought them together and they shook hands and, and the world went, wow, that was a really big achievement. That was a high point for Carter's presidency because no one had done it before and no one has been able to do it since. Israel and Egypt are always at odds with, with each other and it all goes back to, you know, goes back to a long time before the whole United Nations creating a homeland for displaced Jews. It goes all the way back to the Crusades, but, um, and even before that. But to get these two sides together to shake, shake hands was huge. Carter also pledged the return of the Panama Canal to the Panamanians by the year 2000, which it did happen in 2000. Um, and we no longer have uh, control, any control whatsoever at the Panama Canal. The Panamanians do it. it. Says here, the Democrats reclaimed the presidency in 1976. The governor from Georgia defeated Ford, uh, who had become president. 1974, the oath of office was taken on the Bible used in the first inauguration by George Washington. It was administered by the Chief Justice of the United States, Warren Berger, at the east front of the Capitol. The new president and his family surprised the spectators by walking from the Capitol to the White House after the ceremony. Most presidents wouldn't do that, um, although I believe Biden did that too, um, because of the fear of the, you know, assassination, that kind of stuff. But he, uh, he did it. And there's the famous picture right there of the three shaking hands at Camp David. It says the U.S. presidential retreat at Camp David, Maryland, was the setting for a historic moment in September 1978. With the help of Jimmy Carter, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, reached an agreement that would end a 30-year state of war between their countries. Very big. Carter's downfall, though. That one, the the Egypt and Israel handshake Camp David was a high point. The, the reason why he's a one-term president is because of double-digit inflation, 13% inflation. The price of everything was going up. Uh, oil prices, was they were huge. They were going up really high. There was this new weird economic situation they called stagflation, right? In, when inflation... Uh, you had inf inflation happen. The price of goods were going up, even though people weren't buying them, which is, is weird. Normally, when people want to buy stuff, if they have money in their pocket, the price of goods is going to go up. However, during the 70s, stagflation hit a stagnant economy, yet still the price of goods went up. It defies logic until you understand why it happened. The price of oil. When the price of oil is high, the price of gasoline is high. When the price of gasoline is high, the price of, of grocery store items are high. Travel is high. You're, when you go to the pumps, it's super high. So airplanes are using fuel and they're, they're, the price for tickets are going up and no one's going and in, in traveling and they're not spending their money. Yet still, the price of goods was going up. Stagflation, the stagnant economy, inflation hitting. Uh, also, during this time, the death of isolationism was realized because of how important oil was. We realized that oil is super important, really, really important. Uh, the, the, Federal, the Federal Reserve raised the interest rate to an unbelievable 20 plus percent. No one was buying cars, houses or using their credit card. Uh, earlier, uh, I talked about SALT, strategic arms limitation talks, and there's uh, Carter signing an agreement with the Soviet Union leader, Leonoy Brezhnev. So there was talk between the United States and the Soviet Union that things were going okay. Uh, but then in 1980, uh, there was a, uh, a boycott, the United States boycott of the Olympics. America's, America led 62 nations in boycotting the games held in Moscow to protest the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan, right? The Soviets invaded Afghanistan for oil. The United States didn't like it, so they boycotted the Olympics in 1980. So uh, Americans didn't compete in that year. Four years later, the Soviets and their allies boycotted the Summer Olympics, which were in Los Angeles. This, uh, another event in, in history um, that was, had, a lot of uh, issue, a lot of uh, attention at the time was the Iranian, Iranian hostage situation. In 1979, Iran's Shah, the Shah was put in, was uh, had been installed in 1953. He was sick. He had cancer. He was brought to the United States for medical treatment. Remember, the United States installed him in 1953 to protect oil. It was a Cold War thing, and they didn't want the Soviet Union 
to go into Iran. So when the Shah left, the Ayatollah Khomeini, this guy coming down the stairs of the airplane, took over. He was uh, wanted to do away with everything having to do with uh, westernizing. Uh, during, when the Shah, when he was in place since 1953, Iran was really uh, progressive. Um, they were westernizing. Technology was an all-time high, whereas Khomeini wanted to go back to the way it was before. Women were forced to wear covers over their face, um, and, and they ripped out all the technology that was there before. They wanted to go back to the way it was, and Khomeini took over, um, and then they stormed the American embassy, and they took a number of Americans hostage. There was an attempt to free these 52 hostages. Um, there, it was a botched attempt. Um, it says here, a daring US military rescue operation, codenamed Eagle Claw, ended in further US humiliation in April 1980. The plan was to land an aircraft covertly in the desert, allowing special forces to infiltrate Tehran and free the 52 hostages. But the planning was flawed and the mission had to be aborted when two helicopters were damaged in a sandstorm and failed to reach the rendezvous point. Worse was to come when another crash into a transport plane was uh, pulling out. It was November 4th, 1979, anti-American Muslim militants stormed the US embassy in Tehran and took hostages. Um, the, the movie Argo is based on this that occurred here. Those hostages stayed in captivity for 444 days. It was on the news every single night at the time. Um, and it wasn't until 1980 uh, when they were released, when Reagan becomes president. We'll be talking about that. Uh, shifting over to uh, the social side of it, TV shows that you might be familiar with, you may not be, that were around during the 1970s, things like Gilligan's Island, Happy Days, uh, Ron Howard, who's a, a big time director now. That's Ron Howard right there. Good Times, uh, the story of the walkers who lived in the projects in New York, The Love Boat, All in the Family, uh, Archie Bunker was a uh, racist. Rob Reiner is also a big time director now. Jimmy Carter was struggling big time. He, the double digit, digit inflation was killing him and uh, he was getting a very bad reputation. Carter did deregulate the airlines um, which uh, has allowed for many different uh, other new companies to be able to come in and compete with the, the standard that used to be that the government controlled everything when it came to the price of, of tickets and whatnot for uh, air travel. But that has just changed since Carter deregulated the airlines. All right, that's the end of part one.